Good morning and welcome to our health and safety webinar on general fire safety. Before we start, we would just like to introduce ourselves. We have Dom Greenwood, who is going to be leading this morning's webinar. He's our senior health and safety consultant and also a national safety trainer. And I'm Victoria Templeton. I'm the HR, one of the HR knowledge managers here who will be um, helping to support field the questions towards the end. A team should also be in the background who will help deal with any technical issues should they arise during the webinar this morning. Do let us know if you have any questions as we go through the webinar. Please note there are lots of you attending today, so for obvious reasons you are all on mute. But that said, we do want to hear your questions. And so we'll be taking questions from you um, at the end of the webinar. So please do start noting your comments in the comments box as we go through. And here's a quick guide just to show you how we do that. So. You can ask the questions via the GoToWebinar panel that should look something like this. And then please type your question in the questions pane and we'll aim to read out and answer as many questions as we can at the end. Depending on how many we have and timing, of course, then if we need to get back to the questions after the webinar, then we will do so. And as usual, we do want to make this session as interactive as we would normally at our physical events. So we will be running a series of polls throughout the session as well. When we have a poll, it will appear on your screen and you just select the answer that's appropriate for you. Please note, though, that to be able to participate in the polls, you will need to ensure your screen is not in full screen mode, um, as for some reason, GoToWebinar um, doesn't work the polls in that way, so come out of the full screen mode. So I'm now going to hand over to Dom, who will now take you through the webinar this morning. So let's hand over to Dom. Over to you then, Dom. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria, and uh, welcome everybody to this next in a series of health and safety um, webinars. And today, obviously, we're on general fire safety. So, just quickly flush up the agenda. So, it's obviously all around fire. Um, we've got quite a long agenda today. The first thing we're going to talk about is what you know. Why? Why do you need to know about it? We're then going to cover some some brief legislational points. Think about and talk about statutory compliance. A very important and relevant and law-abiding document called the Fire Risk Assessment. Different classifications of fire, fire extinguishers, and why we use them and what they're used for. And then further training that you, your, your workforce or staff can go on and then some signposting at the end as well. So there's a few bits to get through and hopefully you'll enjoy it and um, it'll give you a, a brief understanding of, of why fire is so important. I thought it was interesting to talk about workplace fires and the the, uh, the caption there is they're more common than you think with the home office figures showing that last year um, the fire and rescue services attended around 35,000 primary fires in non-dwelling buildings, which means that's where people don't live. Um, these resulted in 115 deaths and then a further 892 non-fatal casualties. So if you sort of add, add that all together, you're talking about a thousand people a year, which may seem like a small number, but it's a thousand people too many that are either unfortunately having fatal accidents in the workplace or, or, or um, serious accidents uh, due to fire. And interestingly, around 3,000 businesses every year have a workplace fire from a minor fire to the very major and catastrophic uh, fires as well. So that, that is a lot of businesses you'll appreciate. And some big numbers on this on this last uh, uh, panel there is that UK insurers are paying around £3.6 million a day for fire damage with an estimated £8.3 billion being spent on um, fires, uh, which is obviously uh, bad for the UK economy and, and, and business in general. So, you know, just a slide there to frame why we're talking about it. It's really, really important. You know, fire is so dangerous, used very much in, in a lot of different work processes, manufacturing processes and things like that. But if it's not used correctly, the uh, the very, very damaging can happen. In 2020, 557,299 incidents were attended by the fire services in England. And there were around 243 fire related fatalities in 2020. And the good news there is that it's the lowest number that we've seen um, since the, the early 80s, which is great. And I think fire fire in general is a, is a lot more planned, respected, trained than it was. However, I think we've still got some way to go. Interestingly, 82% of fire related fatalities were at home 
in the work in the home in dwellings and, and i just don't think we uh, use or implore the same level of understanding training and procedures and policies in at uh, home and, uh, and nor probably should we but but maybe if, if if you can take anything from today is maybe look at your fire safety at, at home you know leaving candles on leaving doors open tools out electrical safety things like that and with children as well so interestingly 82 percent of fire related fatalities were in the home in it last year and then the last point there really is any type of building could suffer from a fire with around 656 fires and hospitals in that year 686 in educational premises schools colleges universities crashes that type of thing 1725 in shops alongside around 2100 in, in industrial and commercial premises where risks are perhaps high but again if we add all those together we are way over the 3000 we talked about earlier and you know i'm very aware that a number of you are from some of those settings we've got people on today from hospitals schools shops industrial sites so i thought it was important to pick out some of those numbers so you can see just how how dangerous fire can be Arson is still the mo the number one cause of workplace fires with the Chief Fire uh, Council suggesting that around 50% of fires in the workplace are due to arson. This is the single largest cause of fires attended by emergency services, so it absolutely shouldn't be overlooked by employers. So think about your workplace, think about your outside areas where bins are stored, really bins, skips, um, could they be set on fire when everyone's gone home, have you got security, is there gates that you can lock? Um, it could be a disgruntled customer, disgruntled employee, or it just could just be uh, people that just want just want to set fires. Unfortunately, that still is a mindset and mentality that happens. I'm going to show you a slide in a minute where it happened to me in the workplace. So just think about um, how you could minimise that in your workplace. Faulty, faulty electrical equipment, particularly hazardous, as it can't often be put out with water. And you'd be surprised how many workplaces I go round, and I'm only seeing water fire extinguishers, which, as you know, cannot cannot be used on the electrical system. So think about the, the fire extinguishers you've got in the workplace, and absolutely in an office area, a server area, or an area where there's a lot of electric, electrical items. You need to think about probably CO2. Electrical fires are very costly because the the um, the fire can spread through the electrical wiring system and then spread to different parts of the building as you'll appreciate and loose wires faulty connections and overworked plugs i'm seeing loads of overworked plugs and extension leads all the time at the moment it can cause sparks that turn into an uncontrollable blaze if you use an extension leads which we all do please make sure they're they are uh, appropriate for the job that you're using them for think about the machinery and the equipment that you want to run from the extension leads Flammable materials, improper storage of flammable materials is, is a common cause and certainly if you've got anything that requires what we call a disease assessment which would be dangerous substances uh, which could explode they absolutely should, should be stored in a, in a well ventilated room and potentially either a brick built store or a disease stroke kosh cabinet and again I'm seeing quite a number of uh, products and, and substances that are, are, aren't stored in that way and are in a main area so just think about what flammable materials you may have and also combustibles what if, if there were to be a fire in the office or the workplace what what actually could catch on fire um, you know cardboard plastics paper that, that type of stuff and accidents do happen as we know um, and employees uh, is unfortunately um, a cause of workplace fires not using equipment correctly not store it, storing uh, chemicals correctly spilling uh, spillages that aren't mopped up properly um, and these can again have massive implications on the business environment so it's, it's all about training do the staff know what they should be doing with the equipment have they been trained on the equipment have chemicals been been stored away correct correctly so they're the top four um, fire um, consequences in the workplace and these are some pictures that I'm hoping you can see that I've either taken on my travels over the last five six seven years whilst working in the leisure and fitness industry or more recently working for HR solutions all ones that I've just come across by doing various training and, and that first picture you'll see is a is is, is, is a um, you know a plant room storage room and what you will see in the corner is is the electrical the electrical consumer units the main gas inlet um, pipe there as well but just the amount of con uh, combustible materials and the fact the door has been taken off is, is obviously very bad practice so think about your storage areas and uh, and cleaning cupboards and plant rooms and again this is a you will appreciate is some is a co either a corner shop or a supermarket 
and the amount of combustible items there that obviously are going to go out of that door at some point but the blocking of the fire exit is is actually against the law and now carries up to for, a forty thousand pound fine so think about where you're storing or leaving your combustible items before they go out to the to the waste bins in the yard that was originally a um, as you'll appreciate an extension lead a barrel extension cable and what happens is people don't unravel them to their full potential and just use them for the distance they need and then depending on the item they're plugging into it that that wiring gets really 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 hot and you can then see what happens and i've seen over the years a number of very high powered equipment run off barrel extension cables and they do melt unfortunately and that not only is hot but it can then start a fire the misuse of extension cables there are probably four or five in that picture and i think there's a further one that you can't see that's coming out of the picture into another one so again think about the extension leads that you're using they're all they're all drawing heat they're all drawing power is there a better way of doing it if you really need that amount of extension cables it'd be far better to get an electrician to put a new supply in um, or run a cable or chunked cable into a, a double socket or just get better extension cables that are uh, with switches unfortunately we all buy the cheapest ones and they're not always the best for the job again we've got then got we've got a, uh, a storage of combustible items there by the fire exit and the last picture there is of a of a chemical uh, lorry um, where I think uh, the, the driver was either smoking or there was a spark and unfortunately the whole thing caught on fire. There's loads of these pictures available online you'll appreciate if you put in fire safety, um, health and safety issues or incidents and they'll all come up but let's not make these uh, um, a common common occurrence and, and obviously I don't want these to, to be with any of our clients, partners or customers so think about your fire safety. And this was one I was involved with. I used to work for a company called Energy Fitness and the brand was called Fit for Less and they had a fire in the Dundee site. Um, I think that's a really, really great picture. You've got the two fire officers work it, walking by. This was, these, these were images taken from the local newspaper and it was an arson. A large fire was ripped through an indoor market in Dundee, the second major blaze in the city in 24 hours. 60 firefighters and nine appliances tackled the fire. Uh, witnesses reported the walls collapsing. The fire came the day after another major major fire in, at the Brave View Academy, and actually, unfortunately, uh, the, the next three days there were f three further fires at a local factory, a local church, and a, and a, and a fifth a fifth place. It was a, a young arsonist with a can of petrol that was avidly going around setting places on fire. The reason I've showed this is is that the having worked for that company and know, knowing the owner, the, the the devastation that that company went through and the loss of documents, staff jobs, customers, um, many many years of hard work uh, was just un unbelievable. Yes, it was covered by insurance. That whole thing took around a year to get uh, paid out and investigated and uh, and sorted. So there was a year of just massive disruption. So a fire, if it happens can happen but let's make sure we've done everything we possibly can to make sure it doesn't and if it does um have you got the systems policies procedures documents stored elsewhere in place so i just thought i'd share that with you going to come to our first poll and it'll come as no surprise that the question would be is do you feel that fire safety is taken seriously in your workplace after the last seven or eight slides i've shown you with the images i've shown you and, and the different things that we just, i've just been talking about do you feel that it's taken seriously? And I'm going to hand back to Victoria to, to, to put Thank the poll, poll up. Thank you. And uh, very interesting and shocking pictures there, Tom, <laughs> that you've just uh, shown. So I'm going to launch the first poll. Do you feel that fire safety is taken seriously in your workplace? I'll give you a few moments and the answer is obviously yes or no. Remember not to be in the full screen mode. Okay, a few more moments and then I'll close the poll and share it. Okay, let's close that poll. I'm going to now share it, Dom. Okay. So what it's saying is that 90% do feel that fire safety is taken seriously, so you'll be pleased to hear that, um, with 10% saying no. Yeah, obviously that's a great score. We'd love it to be 100%. 100 yeah. And it'd be great. 
if the if the ten percent of people want to reach out at any point and talk to me, or, or or HR solutions about maybe the reasons why they don't feel it's taken seriously, if we can help in any way, you know, we'd love to do that. The great news there is that ninety percent of everybody that's on the call today does feel it's taken seriously, and I'm hoping the next few slides when we talk about compliance and the law and different documents, you, you know, you've got that in place. So that, that's great news. Has that moved on, Victoria? Yes. Brilliant. OK, I just thought I'd cover some of the fire legislation in the UK with the primary piece of legislation being the fire regulatory reform, fire safety order, very, very wordy. You'll often hear it termed as the fire reform order or the fire safety order, and it was incepted in 2005 and it basically replaced all previous fire legislation. It was originally in the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 and it was taken out in 2005. And there was the Fire Services Act and the Fire Safety Act um, that, that dated back to the 60s, 70s and 80s that have just been fully um, replaced. Where does the reform law apply? Anywhere that people go for work or leisure. So that's pretty much anywhere we go. Cinemas, museums, nightclubs, venues, theme parks and obviously where we work. However, there are six exceptions. One would be your home, domestic premises. That doesn't mean to say though that you can now go home and start making bombs or doing silly things with fire because obviously that's still a criminal offence but it doesn't. the legislation doesn't cover domestic. Offshore installations, it doesn't cover oil rigs and the reason for that was, and for the people that were did, did the course on Monday, um, there was a major major disaster in 1985 called Piper Alpha and Lord Cullen changed the, um, the, fire, the fire safety regulations around that time in the mid 80s and took uh, offshore installations out of the fire safety bill and it now has got its own, it's now got its own um, legislation as have ships, railways, licensed vehicles and mines and boreholes. So there's six exceptions. Who is responsible for delivering the act at work? The primary uh, and ultimate responsibility owner would be the head of establishment and for want of a better word that would be the owner of the business or it could be like a chief executive, the highest ranking officer or owner. However, the nominated competent person has also got a shared responsibility. If somebody has got safety in their job title or they're, they've been deemed as the competent person or they've attended safety training or they are the fire marshal, they would, have, they would obviously have a, have a joint responsibility with bringing fire legislation into the workplace and making sure process practices and training is up to date. And we're going to cover some of that uh, a bit later in the, in the webinar. So what is the Act actually asking you to do as an employer, owner, competent person? It's pretty straightforward, really general duty of fire safety care. It's asking you to assess fire hazards and fire risks, complete a document that's called the fire risk assessment that is now law. It wants you to remove hazards as far as reasonably possible. And for anybody that's done any health and safety training, you'll recognize that terminology. Reasonably practicable is the, is the buzzword in the 1974 Health and Safety Work Act. Reasonably possible is its equivalent in the 2005 fire safety order wants you to re reduce risks as far as reasonably possible and that may not be be possible if I think of some of the clients that I'm working with that use um, furnaces and clay ovens and fire in their processes to remove risks um, totally wouldn't wouldn't work so can we remove them as far as reasonably as poss possible and then the protection against the effects of a fire should one start and that could be fire prevention could be fire extinguishers it could be in its training so they're the, they're the kind of six legal duties you've got under the legislation and interestingly, there are 13 user guides, depending on what kind of premises or in industry you're from. And you can quite clearly see those one to 13, offices and shops, factories and warehouses, sleeping accommodation, which obviously would be hotels, uh, B&Bs, uh, guest houses, that type of thing. Residential care premises, educational premises, small medium, medium assembly places. So I'm from the fitness and health leisure industry and leisure centers and gyms would come under guide six, small and medium assembly places with larger places of assembly being anything that's bigger than that, maybe um, a larger museum, um, a big, a bigger area where people get together. Theatres and cinemas, open air events, which could be concerts, it could be air shows, it could be that type of thing. Healthcare premises, as we know, would be hospitals, medical uh, facilities, that type of thing. Transport premises, means of escape for disabled people and animal premises and stables. There is a link there, very, very long, um, I would advise you all to click on that because all these guides come up. Just download them, have a look at them, use them as a reference. It will give you loads of tips. It will help you um, with, with, with understanding your fire risk assessment. You could also use it for training with your staff. And it's just a really handy and free guide that you can use uh, depending on what um, industry you're from. So I'm hoping that's, hoping that's useful for everybody. 
There's six legal duties the employer needs to be aware of. It's asking you to nominate persons for special roles in brackets, uh, have a fire safety officer or a fire warden. If you're a small office or retail premises, you potentially wouldn't need a fire safety officer. If you're a complex organization with manufacturing, with processes including fire and with probably 50 to 100 staff, you possibly would need a fire safety officer, but you absolutely would need fire wardens and you'll have heard the term fire marshals. It's largely the same thing, but have you got those in place and are they trained? Have you consulted your employees about these people and what they're actually gonna do with regards to the improvement in fire safety measures? If you're sharing a premises, and if I think about uh, some of the gyms that I used to visit uh, last year, a number of them would be sharing a premises with maybe a retail store, maybe a DIY store, maybe um, a B&M store, that type of thing. But they're under the same roof and they often share the same fire exits. You have to work with them and they have to tell you their fire risks and you have to tell them yours. And it's obviously advisable to undertake fire drills together. If you're in control of a premises, you are responsible for that part of the building that you are in control of. So have you got a fire alarm, emergency lighting, fire extinguishers, a deluge system, uh, a fire suppression system, depending on what you're doing. So it's worth thinking about that. Have you got a way of establishing or, and contacting uh, the emergency services? And that sounds strange. However, think what happens at five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. So when everyone's gone home, what does your alarm system do? Have you got a BT Red Care, ADT Red Care, Blue Care system that should your building be on fire in the early hours of the morning, you're not waiting for the dog walker coming by or somebody just to happen to see the smoke coming out of the roof. So establishing a way of contacting the emergency services. And the reason for that is twofold. It's one, to mitigate the effects of your um, building, spreading to somebody else's but it's also to safeguard your property intellectual uh, property um, money premises the whole thing to get the emergency services there as quickly as possible so think about how you can contact the emergency services your alarm system may have that ability contact your alarm supply and see if it's available and then employees have to cooperate with you as the employer to ensure the workplace is safe from fire. And that could be thinking about smoking, where they smoke on site, whether you don't allow them to smoke on site, is there a designated area, hazardous chemicals, exploding articles um, and processes as well. So they're the six legal duties. And there's a few areas that the, um, the legislation is asking you to develop. And the first of which is, is an emergency plan. Have you got an, an, an EAP, an emergency action plan that's available that covers more than just fire? And we're gonna talk about it a bit later in the webinar. Many companies have this plan, but unfortunately, a lot of the staff don't know about it or it sits in a folder. So have you brought it to life? Have you trained people? Do they know what to do if there's a fire or you're away or, or something happens in the middle of the night? Have you thought about a business continuity plan? Have you got a document that will talk about what you would do should your building be devastated by fire and you've got to rebuild it or it's closed or whatever it might be? You could have customers. You might need to look at insurance. You might have orders coming in. What would you do should that be the case? Also, what would happen if a neighbouring um, property or premises caught on fire and caught your building on fire? What would happen? So something called a business continuity plan. Some insurance companies ask you to put that into place. We can help you with that. You can obviously go on the internet to think about how you'd structure that. We've already talked about it, but the plan, the legislation is asking you to evidence training for fire wardens and fire marshals. They're also asking you to do regular evacuation drills. And the law is once a year. I don't potentially think that's enough. So my advice to all my clients is do a quarterly fire drill and or when you have new staff join the company as part of an induction process. Maintenance of building and emergency systems. We've already talked about fire alarms. Think about fire doors, escape lifts, escape hatches, fire hoses, fire blankets. There's a little bit more than just the fire alarm. And is all this in a file of evidence? Have you got a file? Uh, that should the fire safety authority or the health and safety executive or your local environmental health officer come, come in, you can just say it's all in the fire folder and everything's in there, structured, structured with dates, times, and maybe a matrix of when things have been done. The last point there is, have you got these systems documents training and services in place? I'm hoping that's given you some, some bits to think about when you go back to work um, with regards to fire. And again, more than happy to talk to anybody should they want any advice or, or questions. So I'm gonna move on to the second poll with the second question being, do you have fire safety training at your workplace and qualified fire marshals? And I'm gonna hand back to Victoria to, to frame the second poll.
Thank you, Dom. I'm going to now launch the poll for everybody. And it's a straightforward yes or no answer. Okay, just wait for a few more moments. Still got a few votes coming in. Okay, I'm going to close the poll and share it with you all. So 72% say they do have fire safety training, qualified fire marshals, 28% do not. Okay, so we've had a slight drop from the first poll, which is interesting because I would have expected them to be similar. So again, I think the, the question would be is for the 72%, great that great that you're doing that and, and, and it feels like you've probably got that in place for the 28 percent is think about doing more fire drills maybe training staff and training can be anything it doesn't have to be accredited training it can be watching a video it could be the manager talking about what we were doing in the event of a, an evacuation however obviously there is accredited certified training that we can help you with fire marshals are part of the fire reform order you, you have to have those in place if you're employing more than five people so think about how you can get those in place and also what would happen should there be a, either a loss of life or catastrophic incident on, in the in the premises and you haven't got those in place it could be your insurance could potentially be val invalid which takes me on to the next point really which is about a competent person both the health and safety work act and the fire safety order ask you to have a competent person with the de definition being somebody who's got sufficient training qualifications knowledge and experience and other qualities that allow them to assist the responsible person with health and safety matters the level of competence required would depend on the complexity of the situation and the organization so again if we think think about uh, an office setup in comparison to a chemical plant the the complexity is very very different what i would say though is that a regulator would ask to see competence and proof they would want to see what training you've done um, refresher training your induction that type of stuff um, so proof of competence may need to be demonstrated and verified by a regulator or enforcement officer if there was an accident incident allegation or legal proceedings and I've actually been part of this before where uh, there's been a, an accident on site and I've had a, um, a solicitor a law a, a law company contact me to, to verify the competence of somebody that's attended my training and it's absolutely fine because they passed and the training is certified but you know this this is this is a real situation so think about your competent person and what qualities they've got um, with regards to health and safety and fire your statutory compliance obviously we talked about the fire risk assessment it's a legal requirement if you're the, if you're a responsible person for a building for example employer owner or occupier of the premises you need to make sure a suitably competent person completes a fire risk assessment and what i would say with that is it's a legally binding document that could go into court with you so my view would be unless you've done a fire risk assessors course you potentially wouldn't want to be doing a fire risk assessment um it, it's it's a very complex document and you have to look at um, various different classifications of fire, fire equipment, the building uh, itself, CDM, CDM regulations, um, fire doors, and it's, it's quite complex. So it's always worth trying to think about a, a um, competent uh, company to put that in place for you. Uh, and you're looking at anywhere between sort of four to six hundred pounds um, uh, for that document to be created. If you've got five or more people in the premises, you'll need to have a fire risk assessment as a written record. And I would advise anybody, even if you've only got two or three people, to always write down your risk assessments. Um, if it's not written down, it's not evidenced. Make sure you review your risk assessment regularly. We suggest annually or if the building changes. So if you start using a room for something different, if you, if you change your business or you move premises, you would need to do a new fire risk assessment. It's good, good business sense as well as a legal requirement and often businesses don't recover after a fire and effective fire prevention starts with proper properly understanding the risks. So it looks at electrical safety, it looks at sources of ignition, combustible items and all, the, and all that kind of stuff and we're going to go through it shortly. I'm just going to do a quick piece on uh, thorough inspections and servicing as part of the legislation for statutory compliance. Your fire alarm needs to be serviced and thoroughly inspected every six months and it's a misconception that it's every 12 months because the fire um, extinguishes and emergency lighting is 12 months but it has to be done every six months. 
Again, you can't do that unless you've done a fire servicing course. You can do checks on maybe a weekly, monthly basis to make sure it's working, but the actual thorough servicing and certification has to be through a fire alarm company. Emergency lighting, absolutely you can do a daily test, which is a visual inspection of the, the, of the emergency lighting system to see if it's working. You may have a green or a red LED in, in the ceiling or the light, or it may be that you've got a switch on the wall. But yeah, but again, you need a competent company to come and do a thorough inspection on an annual basis and give you a certificate. And again, the fire extinguishers um, will uh, can be checked by yourselves on a, on a on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to make sure that they're still there, they're in place, they're on the wall. But again, a company uh, will come in and give you a permanent record of service and maintenance inspections of the fire extinguishers on an annual basis. So they're the three items that have to be checked, maintained, and service. Uh, under the fire regs. Fire drills and training we talked about earlier in the webinar, essential part of any workplace or public building for practicing what to do in the event of a fire. They also are a legal requirement under the order. You should carry out at least one a year, but as I said earlier, we suggest a quarterly fire drill documented with everybody take, take, taking part. Which moves us on to the fire risk assessment. And it must fulfill all of these different um, requirements. It must identify potential hazards, identify the people that could be at risk in the business. And don't just think about staff. It could be visitors, contractors, consultants, um, children, if you've got an open day, uh, work experience, apprentices, uh, disabled people, vulnerable people. It's asking you to take action to remove or uh, remove risks. There's a, a typo there, so I do apologize. It should be remove or reduce risks. Take precautionary, necessary precautions to protect people from the risk. Ensure people are aware of what they need to do in the event of a fire and ensure people are aware of their actions and responsibilities in case of a fire. And again, arson prevention. What have you done to actually make sure that things cannot be set on fire once the business is closed? I'm just going to flash all these points over at the same time because this is what your fire risk assessment should contain. And if you do get a fire risk assessment from a company and it doesn't hit all these points, go back to them because it should identify potential hazards, identify sources of ignition, sources of fuel, sources of oxygen, the people that are at risk, what they advise you to do to evaluate and reduce the risks, what precautions people need to take, ensuring that people are aware of what they need to do. There's training, information, instruction of staff. It will also feed into your emergency procedures and help you develop a strategy for arson prevention. So when you get your fire risk assessment from your competent company, make sure that it's got all those sections in there because it absolutely should have. Please don't just put it on the shelf and, and, and think, well, we've, we've hit the legislation, now we don't have to do anything because at the back of your fire risk assessment, there should be a matrix or an action plan with all the things that they are, they're advising you to do over the next month, six months and 12 months to be fire safety compliant. I'm just going to hand you over again to Victoria for our final, I think it's our final poll. Yes, And the last you. question will be, Following on from that last slide, do you have a fire risk assessment at work and has it been reviewed? Thank you, Dom. Thank yeah, you. I'll launch the poll now. Here we go. Do you have a fire risk assessment at work and has it been reviewed? Just wait a little bit longer. Okay. I'm going to look to close the poll. Okay. And share the results. So we have 75% um, that do have a fire risk assessment and it has been reviewed versus 25% who say they haven't or don't. Okay, so very, very, again, very similar figures from the second poll there. So there's obviously a correlation. What I would say is if you haven't got one in place, I think you need to be thinking about talking to maybe a manager, safety manager, owner, just to say, you, did you know? Because it could be that they weren't aware of it. And again, I'm more than happy to help direct um, and signpost people with regards to that. For the 75% of people that are on the webinar that have, that's great news. Just make sure you do review it and you're aware what's in it and absolutely look at that recommendations page or the matrix to make sure you're doing everything that uh, it's suggesting that you do. 
classifications of fire, I'm just going to whisk through these because, um, again, it's a misconception that all fires can be treated in the same way and with the same extinguishers and, uh, and all that kind of stuff, and they can't. There are loosely six classifications of fire, and we're going to run through them quickly now with, with classification A being wood, paper, cloth, rubbish, and plastics. All the stuff that you would probably find at home um, and, and or in an office setting and, and, and often in the first picture there in waste settings. So think about arson, you know, this is a class class A fire, it's going to spread very quickly, very, very easy to start because wood and paper cloth is very thin and can start quite, quite easily. Class B, liquids, flammable liquids, petrol, oil, grease, acetone, paint, solvents. I know a number of these different uh, liquids are used in manufacturing, in um, warehousing storage factories that type of environment so just think about how these are stored think about spillages the fumes from petrol can catch on fire the explosive properties of petrol and acetone is really really potent so just make sure that's stored away and staff are wearing ppe and know what to do should they spill it class c would be gas and these this potentially wouldn't be one that a lot of our either clients and or um, people on the webinar may be involved with, but it's all the gas that you'd expect, natural gas, propane, butane. A lot of these are gases that we use, in again, in manufacturing, in different DIY uh, jobs and, and or at home or at leisure. But we've got methane, hyd hydrogen, acetylene is often used in tools, acet acetylene cutters, things like that, and ammonia. So there's a number of gases that are flammable. And what I would say with these is and look at look at the picture of the LPG um, tank there. Should should you have a gas fire, you, you're potentially not gonna not gonna be able to deal with that. If you are storing LPG or you've got any of these uh, items in external storage, you need to think about putting fire extinguishers around uh, six to eight meters away from the uh, the storage receptacles so that you could you could tackle that fire um, should you need to, but it, this is definitely going to be a fire services job. Burning metals, there's a number there again, potassium, sodium, aluminium, magnesium, uranium. If anyone's got uranium or plutonium, I think we need to ask why that would be, but um, calcium, titanium. So there's a number of metals that do have low burning property, um, whereas steel, um, tin, iron, that type of stuff doesn't, but these are thinner metals with, with different properties in them. So think about um, burning metals. Class E, which actually isn't a class, but it's an easier way to think about it, would be electrical. Um, misuse of equipment, you'll see the hairdryer on the right there is just caught on fire. It could be a miswiring, loose wiring, that type of thing. Um, it could be um, a, in the second picture there, a consumer unit that's not been um, commissioned properly or it's overloaded with fuses. And the first picture there would be, again, misuse of extension leads with uh, extension blocks being put in uh, to distribute distribute the power. So think about electrical safety. And a newer classification of fire um, is, is F. So cooking fats, oils grit and greases. And the real big one here is not to use a water fire extinguisher because a phenomenon called a blevy can happen, which is a, bo a boiling liquid evaporating uh, vapor explosion basically if you use water on a, a cooking fat oil or grease fire it will turn immediately to a ball of steam and will spread the fire so if you're in a commercial kitchen hotel kitchen you need to think about a, um, a class f fire extinguisher which we're going to go on to shortly and there's quite a nice poster there which again you could download or you could buy quite cheaply and put in a staff area do you know your fire classifications types of fires in the second column, symbols in the third, and, and the different extinguishers to, to use in the fourth. I think that's quite an, a neat little poster to put on your health and safety board, the staff notice board, whatever it might be, um, and just gives the staff a bit more awareness. Which brings us on to fire extinguishers. You'll have all seen these before. I'm hoping you've got an array of these in your workplace. And this is what the, the placement and, uh, and the amount of these that you would have is driven by the fire risk assessment. It's not just a question of, well, I think we need four. Now we need six. Do we need powder? Should, should we get some foam? The fire risk assessment will look at the process, the procedures and the different things that you're doing in the workplace and would then drive how many fire extinguishers and what sort you would have. There's a nice little acronym that you can just go through with staff, which is PASS. Pull the pin, aim at the base of the fire, squeeze the top handle and sweep from side to side. The caveat to that would be on the CO2, please tell staff not to touch the black horn because it gets freezing cold and they will definitely get some kind of um, uh, freezer burn. So um, 
practice, show them the fire extinguishers. This is what you do. You pull the pin out, you take the tag off, squeeze the handle, sweep from side to side. There's loads of videos available on, online. You could quite easily run a little fire safety session with the staff, maybe once a month over a 20, 30 minute period. Please remember fire extinguishers are just for small isolated fires. The big, the big water extinguishers are um, redundant within about a minute and the CO2s are redundant within about 20 to 30 seconds. So that gives you an idea that if a, if a fire has really taken hold and you've not got it out within 30 to 60 seconds, that fire extinguisher is going to be redundant. So it really is an aid to help you escape from the building um, and are only supposed to be used for short duration. Always keep the fire um, in front of you with the exit behind you. And again, a little bit like the post I showed you before, there's a nice little code there water, dry powder, foam CO2, and the one on the end is the wet chemical, the class F fire extinguisher for use. It can be used on uh, wood, paper and textiles, but it's used for cooking oils, fats and greases. And it's got a, a chemical in there that creates like a, a film or foam um, that solidifies over the cooking oil and uh, cuts off the oxygen to the fire. I think staff awareness is really, really important and very key. And again, there's a nice little guide there um, that you could again think about maybe buying a poster of and displaying it in a staff area on a health and safety notice board with the first panel being uh, the fire triangle. There's only three st steps to that, which is oxygen, heat and fuel. And if a fire hasn't got any of those, it won't it won't uh, flourish or, or develop. So if we can put out any of those, the, f the fire will go out. There's a little very small section on the fire safety law. We just talked about it earlier in the webinar, but just give the staff some awareness of that. The third panel is duties of the responsible person and employees with sources of ignition and sources of fuel in the top right corner. And the next steps with regards to the fire risk assessment being at the bottom. And I think that's just a really neat little guide that you could potentially give either give staff maybe at an induction stage or you could, as I, as I say, email to everybody, put into a newsletter or again, put on, on, a, on a health and safety uh, notice board. So if we think about further training and support, you know, have you thought of training your staff to understand fire safety? Um, this has been an hour webinar. Um, you could quite easily do something similar or you could um, invite them to, to future webinars. Have you thought about embedding the fire safety policy and knowing what to do if they're an incident or emergency? Most fires happen when the responsible or competent person isn't there. And it, do the staff know what to do? Um, it'd be an interesting exercise to think about if you, you know, do you all feel uh, fully, fully um, confident that everybody knows what to do whilst you're on this webinar? Should there be a fire in the workplace? And, if, and obviously, if the answer is not quite sure or no, let's think about some further training and support. We can help you by organising a fire safety awareness training session, which would be largely very similar to what you you guys have just gone through. And maybe it would take an hour, hour and a half. We can do it online uh, and show you some videos. Or we can host a level two safe cert regulated level two fire safety course for up to 12 people. I'm running one next Monday. I've already got seven people booked on, which is fantastic. I can do that in the workplace. And you will also do practical fire safety um, demonstrations and understand how to use a fire extinguisher practically. And we cover all the topics we've covered over the last 45 minutes, obviously in a lot more detail and depth. We can also help you by developing a fire safety policy and plan and an emergency action plan with all of the support in forms, check sheets and supplementary documents needed to effectively manage an incident or allegation. What you don't want is there to be a small fire. And I had this in a gym that I was looking after. I was the head of compliance for, for a fitness company. There was a small fire in a London-based gym, one of the air conditioning units caught on fire outside of the gym and the flames came through the vents on the air conditioning and caught a wall on fire and the staff successfully put the fire out. There was no loss of life, loss of premises or loss of um, um, uh, possessions. The next day, London Fire Brigade came and did a full, full investigation because someone told them and the first thing they wanted to see was, can we look at your fire risk assessment? Can we look at how the staff are trained? Can we look at your fire safety policy and your emergency plan? And luckily, they had that. And, and I could prove that they had that and they'd done the training. But, you know, could you prove that at the moment, should you have a fire and or an investigation? We can also conduct a fire risk assessment on site. It's going to take generally a day on site, depending on the complexity of the business. So I, I did one uh, earlier in the year that took two days, purely because the workplace had about six or seven different buildings on the site and did did 
uh, up to three or four different processes with 25 different work areas. So it took, a, it took two days with a further day to, to write that up. But in general, it will take one day on site and then allow half a day to write that up. Um, the cost of that is going to be, as I said earlier, between four and six hundred pounds, depending on the complexity of the organisation. What I would say is, if if you're getting quoted um, significantly less than that, I would ask, you know, I'd ask, is it is it the right fire risk assessment for you? Is it a robust document? Is it going to stand up in court? Does it have all the components that you need it to you need it to have? So that's how we can help you. There's a little bit of signposting there for you as well. If you want to take a quick picture of that, you're welcome to do so. But I think this, this is going to be available. It's going to be sent out. The Health and Safety Executive has got a section on its website under fire. So it's always worth checking the hse.gov.uk website. There's loads of information on there. There's a fire safety information, um, workplace fire responsibilities um, link as well there. There's also a fire safety guides link, um, which is similar to the one that was in the, in the previous uh, part of the webinar. The Chief Fire Officers Association is really good to look at. You don't have to be a member. There's a, a number of different documents and different advice and guidance on there. And the same with the Fire Safety Advice Centre, which is which is firesafe.org.uk and the Fire Industry Association. They're all really, really good uh, signposting places for you to get information on training, fire prevention, and what you should do in, in an incident or accident. So I think at this point we're going to take some questions, are we, Victoria, or are we going to yes. do your last part? Yeah, yeah. That, that's right. We'll do some um, questions. So we've had a few come through, so thank you, everybody. And we'll go to the first one. And the question is, is an emergency vehicle classed as a licensed vehicle? I'm going to say I don't know, because I don't. Okay. But I would say it would be, but if you want to take the details of that person, I'm more than happy to have a look into that this afternoon and I'll, I'll go to one of my um, accredited bodies to find out. I think it would be, but let's get, okay. the, exact, let's get the exact answer for the person. Yeah, great okay, question. brilliant. Great Thank you. Great, great question. And um, secondly, um, do fire risk assessments have to be done on vehicles that transport flammable items for the organisation? Yeah, definitely. Question, so if you... Question. If, Yes, great, great question. Um, so the work that would still constitute the workplace. So if you're doing deliveries, if you're transporting equipment or flammable materials and you're in a work vehicle, you, it's still the work, still your workplace. So absolutely, um, there'd be a section on there about work um, vehicles. And if, 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 you, if it's been identified that, you're, that it's a risk, it would absolutely have to be in there. So a fire extinguisher in the vehicle, a first aid kit in the vehicle, fire safety policy in the vehicle, I've done something similar to a building company recently where they are transporting around tools and substances and that's what we've had to put in place for them. So the answer would be yes. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And another question about fire risk assessments. If you lease an office within a larger building, who is responsible for having a fire risk assessment? The building owner or a firm who leases some of the space? It's a great question. And, I, and what you need to do is go back to the landlord, landlady, all your tenants agreement and the reason I know that is because I, as I said earlier I was looking after a hundred different gyms across the UK and it worked in either way sometimes the landlord will do the fire risk assessment for you and say here's the fire risk assessment this is what you need to do other ones will say you need to provide a fire risk assessment as well as maybe a legionella risk assessment as well as an asbestos risk assessment so it depends what how the lease is structured it could be that if you're hiring a commercial premises and again I'm working with a client um, that's um, manufacturing the the landlord has provided the building but everything mm. else is, is insurance risk assessments emergency systems fire risk assessment is down to the the tenant but please do check it because it could be that and again i know this from up from up from old it was a misconception is oh they're the landlord's providing that but when they looked they weren't it was down to okay. the tenant to provide it so go back to the tenancy agreement or the landlord landlady and say have you done a fire risk assessment of the building and they'll, they'll either say yes or no, mm. you, it's your responsibility because it could be you're hiring a building, but then you're putting dangerous processes and risks yeah. in that in that building. So you would have to do the fire risk assessment. Oh, OK. So uh, we've had a very similar question uh, on that saying, I assume if you lease your office, your landlord is responsible for the majority of the risk assessment, but it, it, you need to look at your agreement. Um, and, well, and talk to your landlord, landlady. I, mean, yeah. I would say, you know, do, do we need to do it or have you done it? 
because somebody somebody has to have done it. And if yeah. it's just an office, it would be put quite straightforward. Obviously, if it's a you know something a more complex business like the one I've done recently, it, which which took a, a couple of days, um, and and the client was was unaware that they had to do it, thought the landlord had to do it when he checked it. No, no, you, that's your responsibility. You've hired the building. Everything else is up to you. So yeah, okay. I, I'm hoping Thank that's you. answered the question. Sounds very good. Thank you. And then a couple more. Uh, we'll soon be moving into premises that will be set up to get all, and it will be up to us to get all these things in place. We'll need to get some works done to the space before occupying. How soon should I look into getting all of these things in place? And is there someone or a company that can go through all of this and what advice we'll need to have in place? Okay, so first question is I'm more than happy to talk to that person about what they need to do. Secondly, they need to do a pre and post fire risk assessment. What again? What I would do is they need to talk to their their landlord landlady about what needs to be done. So the pre fire risk assessment, and again, I know about these because we do a pre fire risk assessment on a gym that hadn't been open to the public, mm. and then once it had been open to the public and was in use, you'd then go back and do a post a post occupancy fire risk assessment and make the changes, which is what I think this person. Uh, would need to do with regards to their new premises. Um, they'll need to make sure they've got electrical safety looked at, fixed for electrical uh, testing done, obviously gas safe if there's gas boilers. There's there's a number of different things they need to think about before they actually open and allow visitors, clients, customers and staff in there. But but again, I'm, I'm happy to send them or talk to them, you know, off, off the webinar if, if that's appropriate. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. No worries. And final question i'm subletting only two rooms in the building what are my responsibilities it's the same it's the same answer as before really go back to your landlord landlady landlady and, and ask them have they done all these things because it could be that they've done one for the whole building and that covers the 10 or 12 rooms that they've got but it could be that they 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 haven't and each individual company has had to do their own mm. so for instance a company i worked for a few years ago had serviced serviced rooms in, in an office where or building with 60 other companies it was massive but mm. every company had to make sure they'd done their own fire risk assessment had a fire safety policy staff training and, and everything else so to the it's down to each individual company so i think it's, a, it's communication it's talking it's what do we need have you done it can you help us with this do we need it that is that conversation yeah okay brilliant thank you and thank you everybody for submitting those questions so um i think that brings us to the end of the webinar so i'm just going to close up and take you through the last remaining slides so thank you first of all dom for a brilliant webinar and uh, really informative and um, helping us with those questions so in terms of um, further uh, support that we may be able to provide you and your staff um, there is actually just one more poll uh, that we'd like to run and it's just really to find out if there is any more support what that would look like so I'm going to open up the final poll and launch it and we're just interested to know if there is uh, further support would that be on mental health or other health and safety training health and safety services um, HR services or training or other services so the poll should be showing now and if you could uh, be great if you could uh, kindly answer the poll I'll give you a few more moments okay brilliant I'll close that poll thank you everybody and um, That'd be really great and um, we can follow up with you in those specific areas that you'd like further uh, support on. So before we close we would just like to run through some uh, webinars that we have coming up. So the next one in the diary is, is for a couple of weeks down the line. I shall be running that. It's a data and GDPR webinar and it focuses on the compliance and implications after Brexit so please do join us for that. And then we're going to be releasing our next programme this week, hopefully, where you'll be able to start registering. 
and we're going to look at a webinar program through from uh, April through to August. The first one in um, April will be employing people and the 10 things that you need to get right. We're looking at doing that on the 22nd of April. We then have one in May around how to deal with bullying and harassment. And also in May, we're going to do a second one, and that's going to be coronavirus and returning to work after lockdown. And Dom and I will be um, co-facilitating that. So anything that you need uh, to know, whether it's about the health and safety aspect of supporting uh, the employees coming back into work and reopening again, or whether it's from a HR perspective, Dom and I will be leading that webinar on the 20th of May. I'll then be running a webinar in June that's about how to deal with serious allegations and how you can do so, um, handle those safely. And then in July, we're looking at what are protected or without prejudice conversations. And finally, in August, we have a remote working webinar and how can you manage performance when we are now in this remote working environment. So please do look out for those. As I said, um, can't register just yet, but hopefully this week you'll be able to do so. And then just um, a couple of um, reminders for you all. So to support your staff, then we do offer um, Dom does kindly offer the first aiders for mental health qualification. Um, so please do get in touch in regards to that. I don't know, Dom, if you want to just add uh, a couple of lines on your mental health training that you do, um, but we have that available. Yeah, certainly. Obviously, it's, it's, it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. You know, there's there's so much more mental health um, and adverse mental health with regards to, to lockdown. People worrying about going back to work financial pressures people have been made redundant so we do offer um, a mental health awareness uh, session we also offer as we said the level two and level three mental health first aid qualification which I, I run delegated courses in and around Northamptonshire but I can also come to your your place of work and take up to 10 people and takes a day and it's, it's a really good really good session so um, again as Victoria said please get in touch happy to talk to anyone about Booking, booking anybody in um, and yeah look forward to hearing from you. Brilliant thank you and then another form of supporting staff um, an EAP so if you are thinking about introducing an EAP scheme um, then we can put you in touch obviously an EAP is different to uh, I know Don referenced EAP in his webinar um, this is from the employee assistance program perspective and there, that, that's a service that provides that independent and partial service to help employees resolve any uh, challenges that they may have going on um, either in their personal life or from a workplace perspective so um, just wanted to share that with you if you do want to stay in the loop and be amongst the first to be invited to our webinars, as well as receive our latest news and updates, then please do sign up to our newsletter, the details for which are via this link. And that concludes our webinar today. So if you do have any further questions, then please do get in contact with us via the information that's showing on the screen. And we'd be more than happy to help um, and answer any queries that you may have. And as always, we like to receive feedback on our webinars, um, particularly the content. So if there's anything that you would like to feedback to us, then please do so. And we'll be really happy to receive that feedback. And this brings us to a close. So I'd like to just thank Dom for his time today on a really useful and informative webinar. Um, it's really, been really fascinating and um, interesting so thank you and thank you to everybody who's taken the time out there busy diaries to come and join the webinar with us today and we hope to see you on our future webinars so thank you very much